morning, church. Let's worship the Lord together this morning. Thanks for joining us online. He is worthy and worthy to be praised. Let's praise Him. Once again, listen, if your heart has been set on fire by Jesus, if you're a follower of him, then you have no reason to be silent. In fact, you can't. Let's stand in our homes. Let's sing out loud together. Let's worship the God of all creation who is worthy of all our praise this morning. Lift 
your holy name on high. The Lord our God is strong and mighty. We praise the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Open up the ancient door.
we thank you for the gift of life, God, the gift of salvation through your Son. God, we thank you for the very breath that we breathe. Lord, we want to use every breath to worship you, to give you glory this morning, Lord. We love you. There's a river flowing from the mountain that shows our God is true. And there's a song rising from the valley. It's our response to you. You are God, God of all creation. The earth grows, longs to be
to be with you and where we are our hearts are raised to heaven we breathe to worship you Lord it's the very reason we breathe to give you glory Lord to worship you the one who sits on the throne, the ruler of all, the creator of all creation, of all the universe. Lord, we give you glory. So you're worthy. Thank you, Lord. Bless your name. Amen. It is so great to worship God together. Even though we are not all in the same room, we are all worshiping the same God. And it is an incredible privilege to be able to use technology to worship Him together. But there's so much more to worship than singing songs. God has called us to live a life of worship, as living sacrifices of praise. That means we should worship while we sing, while we work, while we play, while we spend time with our families. In whatever we do, we should live to honor the Lord. One way to do this is through giving. So this morning, we want to give you an opportunity to give to the Lord through our time of offering. There are various ways that you can give listed on your screen. You can mail your offering to the church office. You can give online through the church website, gracegory.com. You can give using the Church Center app on your phone. You can even text to give by texting a dollar sign followed by any amount to 84321. However you choose to give this morning, remember that giving is an act of worship. You don't give to the church. We are the church and we give to the Lord and he uses those gifts to change lives. So let's continue to worship the Lord this morning as we take a moment to give. guys are enjoying your kids segment each week. Let's do our review of the fruit of the spirit. There are nine different parts of the fruit of the spirit. Can you say them with me? Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. My grandma is so fun. She loves to joke around and she has an amazing laugh. One day, I told her a joke that I heard at school, but it had a bad word in it, and she didn't laugh at all. I know I shouldn't be telling jokes like that, but it can be so hard to be good. It seems like no one will think that you are cool or funny unless you do bad things or say bad words. But God wants us to be good. Let's do our best to fill our lives with goodness. Romans 12.21 says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I know it's hard to be good all the time, but if we have the Holy Spirit in us, God will help us. We can always pray and ask Him to help us to do the right thing. This week, we want to challenge you, how can you show goodness to others around you? Share your thoughts and ideas with your parents. Have a great week. Bye. Special thanks to Jordan and the whole uh, children's ministry team. You guys are doing a great job. Thanks for that. Uh, it's always been our philosophy at Grace Fellowship that our children's ministry, our youth ministry, they exist to help parents 
disciple their kids. So as you guys are doing this in your home, parents, I want you to know we applaud you. Great job. Keep loving on those kids. Keep uh, being an example of Jesus. One of the cool things we have is these children's coloring pages that you can download and give to the kids. I encourage you to use those each week. Uh, we asked you to send a few of those pictures of did the kids color? How did it look? How did it come out? And uh, this is what we got back. So thanks for doing that. There they are. Look at that. Every one of them is different. I think the kids' faces are actually more valuable than even the coloring pages. <laughs> Great job, guys. I like that one. Do we have some talented children in this church or what? Oh, there's a kid for sure. I always knew his maturity level should have put him in the children's ministry. Hey, by the way, do you remember these guys? We showed you them last week, the kids from uh, Wells of Hope. Well, they too are watching online and they too are participating in our coloring, uh, in our coloring ministry. So check it out what they sent us. Now they had to scan these. They didn't all come in just perfectly. It's a little hard to see, but uh, every one of these was from, from one of the kids at Wells of Hope in Uganda. And it's just another one of those ministries that God is using in many ways. And as we continue to do this uh, around the world, God is using this ministry to just bless people. And we're really excited to see these pictures from the Wells of Hope kids. So thanks to Francis and all the kids at Wells of Hope. Great job, guys. You did an awesome job and we are proud of you. Way to go. Good job on coloring pages. Well, it is May, and I don't know how it suddenly became May, but it didn't. And you know what that means? That means it is time to pack up the family and head to the beach. So you can, oh, wait a second, that's not, never mind. Let's, let's go take two. Okay, hey, I don't know if you realize this, but it's already May. So it is time, you guys, for church picnics and gatherings at the, oh, wait a second. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, take three. Hey, I don't know if you realize this, but it is May already. And that means it is time for family vacations. It is time for family reunions, trips across the country, cruises. <sighs> okay, we can't really do all that stuff either. But it's possible. It's possible that sometime this summer you're going to be able to get your family together and go do something cool. So I want to encourage you to be praying that God will open doors for that in time for you to do that. I don't know if you are a family summer vacation family or not. I don't know if you were raised in a, in a family that took summer vacations every year. My family did not. We were not a vacation family for sure. Uh, in fact, in my lifetime and my childhood, I remember two vacations. One time we drove cross country in the wintertime to Missouri to visit my uh, older sister who had moved there. And the other time I was about 11 years old. And I remember it was my mom, my dad, my brother and me. And we drove up the California coast to Oregon to visit some relatives. And uh, it was a wild vacation in so many ways. On the way up, it wasn't so bad, but it was on the way back that my dad decided we should take Highway 101 instead of the 5, and because it's a much more scenic route. Now, if you know me, you know that I grew up in a family where my mom had a serious drinking problem. And so when we went on this trip, she was not drinking, right? And that didn't set well with her. So we have my mom two days without any alcohol, which was really quite a scene. And then we have my dad, who is driving down the 101 in this big Cadillac, and all he wants to do is look at the scenery, which is fine if you're not the driver. But he's the driver, and he keeps pointing, going, hey, look, do you see that? Look at... And my poor mother is already jittery, and she is freaking out, because if this was a cartoon, it would be like, you know, the back wheels of the car come off the edge of the cliff, and then we come around the corner like that. That's how it was, my dad, and he's just pointing and driving. My mother 
tears are shooting out of her eyes. She's freaking out because she knows we're going to die because my dad's not watching the road. My dad is yelling at my mom in true um, marital love and explaining to her that she needs to just shut up so he can concentrate on the road. She's explaining to him that if he would concentrate on the road, she'd be able to shut up. And my brother and I are in the back seat the whole time holding hands. Now, that tells you how terrified we were because the only time we would touch each other is if our hands were around each other's throats. And here we are holding hands. We're looking at each other with this look in our eyes like, you know, I hope we make it to heaven. It was nice being your brother. We're all going to die in this trip. That was my big memory of what it is to be uh, in a car trip with my parents. You know, it is harder to be in the passenger seat than it is to be in the driver's seat. The only one not scared in that car was my dad. He, he figured he had it all under control. It is a whole lot easier to be the one driving than it is to be the one in the passenger seat. It's not when you're in the passenger seat that you don't trust the driver. It's just that you don't know what he's going to do. And, and, you know, does he see that car slowing down in front of us? Does he see those brake lights? He's not slowing down. Oh, my gosh, what's going to happen? And you begin to freak out and you begin to, to step on that imaginary brake on the passenger side. You know, uh, on my car, that, there's a dent in the floorboard there where my wife usually sits when I drive. And so it is difficult to do that. It's difficult to be in the passenger seat. And anybody who's been walking with Jesus for any length of time can tell you it can be that way with God too. It's possible that you've given over the driver's seat to Jesus in your life, but, but we still keep stepping on that imaginary brake, don't we? We still keep grabbing for the wheel thinking, I don't know if he knows what he's doing. I don't know if he's got this thing figured out. I don't know if this is safe. I don't know if this is going to be okay. Some of us still have this idea that God should basically behave like we want him to behave. If that's your idea, let me encourage you to get over that now. Because God's not taking his cues from you. <laughs> have you noticed that? God's not taking his cues from me either. We think he should behave the way we want him to behave. We, we tend to picture him like a big vending machine. And if I walk up with my dollar and put my dollar in the machine, I should get out what it is I want to get out. But you know what? It's hard when you know what you want, when you think you know what's best, when you think you understand what's going on, and God still doesn't do what you expect him to do when you think you should do it. It can get pretty scary. Honestly, it can get pretty frustrating. You're, you're trying to walk with God, and it just seems like he's driving so close to the cliff. You know, I had such a good time in 1 Kings last week that I thought maybe we could continue and go into 2 Kings this week. So I thought I'd bring you a message from 2 Kings this week. Last week, we looked at the great prophet Elijah. Well, his successor was a guy named Elisha. So first guy, Elijah with a J. Second guy, Elisha with a S-H. And we, we learn a lot about Elisha in 2 Kings. So turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 5. By the way, I really, really hope you guys are bringing your Bible every Sunday because we need it. Um, and we're always going to be in the Word of God on Sunday mornings at Grace Fellowship. So 2 Kings chapter 5, beginning uh, in verse 1. Just follow along. Let me read it to you. Now Naaman, captain of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man with his master and highly respected because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man was also a valiant warrior, but he was a leper. There's always a but, isn't there? I mean, this guy, he was successful in every way, totally successful in his career. He's a great man, even in the eyes of his master. He's highly respected by the people. He is wealthy. He is powerful. He is all that stuff. Naaman had everything going for him. But he was a leper. <laughs> That's no small but. He was a leper. 
That's kind of a big deal, isn't it? Sometimes we hear about lepers in the Bible and, and we're like, ah, I don't really quite get what that is. Leprosy is actually a disease of the nervous system. It's not just some sort of skin condition that we tend to think that it is. It's a disease of the nervous system in which your nerves shut down and you stop feeling sensation. You stop feeling pain. You stop feeling touch. You stop feeling everything. And gradually what happens is you keep uh, cutting yourself and injuring yourself and, and your, your uh, hands become twisted because the nerves are not working in the hands and gradually your limbs become twisted and, and your, your skin begins to rot. It's a horrific, horrific, terrible disease. And leprosy in that day was the kind of thing that they quarantined you for. So just in case you're having trouble relating to Naaman, leprosy, they put you in quarantine. And the reason was because actually... Leprosy is not just transmitted by touch. Leprosy is transmitted in the same way that COVID-19 is transmitted. It's, it's through droplets in the, in, when someone sneezes, when they breathe, when they talk. And so it's very, very easy to get leprosy if you're around somebody who's a leper. This guy had a great life. Everything was going the way it should be going. But... He became a leper. Sometimes things just happen in life out of the blue. Sometimes things just happen in life and everything changes on a dime. Naaman didn't do anything to get leprosy. It just happened to him. And when it happened, everything changed for Naaman. This is going to cost him his job. This will cost him his family. He's going to have to leave the city, live outside of town, and, and no longer see his family anymore. This is going to cost him all of his social ties. He's not going to get to see his friends anymore. And ultimately, as he knows, this is going to cost him his life. So when he is um, diagnosed with leprosy, this is a massive, massive problem for him. Overnight... He goes from being Naaman, the great warrior, Naaman, the great leader, Naaman, the wealthy, powerful guy, to Naaman, the leper. Once you become a leper, it's kind of the only title that matters to anybody. It's no longer important who you were, no longer important what your life was about. You're just a leper. It becomes the most important thing about you. And here's the thing, and it's true for every one of us. Sometimes things happen in life that you just can't control. Did I hear an amen? Sometimes things happen in life that you just cannot control. And it doesn't matter if you deserve it. It doesn't matter what you've done. You find yourself in a situation that is beyond your control. Well, in Naaman's life, despite his bad fortune, God was still at work in his life, even though he didn't know it. Follow along in verse 2. Now the Arameans had gone out in bands and had taken captive a little girl from the land of Israel, and she waited on Naaman's wife. This had happened in the past. She said to her mistress, I wish that my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria then he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus spoke the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Aram said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothes. So he finds out that there's a prophet in Israel who has a reputation for being able to heal the sick. <clears throat> and so he figures, why not? And the king loves this guy, and he wants to help him. So he sends a letter to the king of Israel, so Naaman will have access to the king of Israel. And he sends a letter and asks the king of Israel to do something about this. 
and he loads him up with cash. He gives him silver, he gives him gold, he gives him uh, changes of clothes. Now, clothing was one of, the, one of the signs of great wealth in those days. And so he loads him up with all this stuff, and he sends him to Israel. Verse 6, he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, And now as this letter comes to you, behold, I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill or make alive that this man is sending word to me to cure a man from his leprosy? But consider now and see how he's seeking a quarrel against me. It happened when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent word to the king saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Now let him come to me and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So the king gets this letter. He says, this has got to be some kind of trick. He sends a letter to me asking me to cure a man of leprosy. How am I going to do that? He's obviously looking for a reason to start a fight. But word gets to Elisha, the prophet. And Elisha says, send him to me. Because this will be for the glory of God. Send him to me and he'll find out there really is a prophet in Israel. And that prophet serves the one true God. So in verse 9, it all comes to a head. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots and stood at the doorway of the house of Elisha. Okay, there you have it. This guy Naaman, he gets diagnosed. He, he realizes he's got to do something. He hears about this one in a million chance, this prophet in Israel. Maybe he could do something for me. And he has got the money together. He's got his entourage together. He has got a letter for the king. He's done everything that he can do in his power. And he is now standing on the doorstep of this great prophet. And of course, he is expecting that when this foreign dignitary shows up on the doorstep of a prophet, that the prophet is going to come and greet him, that he's going to pray for him, he's going to pronounce some healing upon him. He has these great expectations. So he has done everything he thinks he needs to do to get God to do what he wants God to do. He's brought his dollar to the vending machine. And now he's standing on the prophet's doorstep. And he has jumped through all the hoops. And he has these expectations of what he will expect to happen next. But guess what? This will be a shock. Things didn't go according to his plan. Imagine that. Look at verse 10. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you will be clean. But Naaman was furious, and he went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Have you ever been there? You said God could drive. You moved over into the passenger seat, but now he's doing it all wrong. It's frustrating, isn't it? And the world is full of people who have stomped away mad at God. All because he didn't do what they thought he should do. And some of you might actually be there right now in your lives. Some of you might find yourself in a situation where, if you're honest, you're pretty mad at God. If you're honest, you're walking away from God. Because you went to him with your problem and your problem has not gotten solved to your satisfaction. And it makes you wonder if he even cares. It makes you wonder if he even exists. And if God's not going to be on your side, then you're not going to be on God's side. And you're walking away from God frustrated, mad. You don't like his standards. You don't like the way he does things. You don't like what he says in his word. You don't like how he wants to... Um, you know, interpose his will into your life and you don't like that when you ask him for certain things, you put your dollar in the vending machine, push the button and your Reese's peanut butter cups do not come out and you're mad. And I could say this 
because I have been exactly there multiple times in my life, frustrated at God because he doesn't seem to get it. Do you ever wonder what amazing things you might have missed from God because you weren't willing to actually trust him to do his thing his way? Naaman was in a tough spot. He had done all that he knew to do, and he still wasn't getting the results he wanted. And what God was calling him to do made absolutely no sense to him. So before you judge Naaman too harshly, like we read this, we're like, it's a Bible study, it's a Bible story, Naaman. It's going to come out fine. Don't worry. It's God. He can take care of it. Yeah, it's easy for us to say that when it's Naaman's story. But when it's your story, maybe it's not so easy. Naaman had done all he knew to do. And he had an actual serious problem that needed a solution. And he didn't know anyone other than God who could give him this solution. And still, the prophet wouldn't even come to the doorstep and meet him. He sends him a, a messenger, tells him to do some dumb thing. Go into the dirty rivers, the uh, waters of the Jordan River. And it's not enough that you're going to go into the waters. You've got to go in, come out, 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 go in, come out. And on the seventh time, you'll be cleansed of your leprosy. If that is not the stupidest thing you've ever heard of, I don't know what is. And yet, that was the message that he got. So you know what he does? He takes his ball and goes home. He stomps away and says, I don't need anything to do with this God. I could bathe in the rivers in my hometown. But thankfully, by God's grace, sometimes he puts a voice in our lives that stops us from doing the stupid stuff we were planning to do. Look at verse 13. Then his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, had the prophet told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more than when he says to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Guys, Naaman must have felt so stinking foolish going in and out of that river. I really doubt that he had much confidence that this was going to work. I mean, he said as much, right? This is ridiculous. Why did he do this? I could bathe in the rivers of my own hometown. I don't need this. It doesn't seem like he had any real confidence. So if anybody has this idea that God only does great things if you have amazing amounts of faith, you got it wrong. God can do amazing things with or without your faith. And here, this guy Naaman doesn't even believe this is going to work. But he figures, why not? It's the only shot I've got. And he was slow in coming around on this, right? But don't ever forget this. The most obvious sign of faith is simple obedience. The most obvious sign of faith is obedience. Naaman obeyed and Naaman was made clean. That day, Naaman received new life. That day, dripping wet with the waters of the Jordan River, Naaman received the gift of life. And some 850 years later, the disciples of Jesus baptize new believers in those same waters and they too came out with new life because of their faith in Christ. You know, I wonder if some of us need to follow Naaman's lead and trust God for new life even though you don't really fully understand what God's up to. Maybe you're watching this today or listening to this today and, and for the first time you're starting to think, you know, maybe I gave up on God a little bit too soon. 
maybe just because it didn't all make a lot of sense to me, maybe because I had a couple of questions that I didn't know how to get answered, I just took my ball and went home. And I wonder if I missed out on the great things that God had for me. Guys, it is so easy to think my way is better than God's way. It is so easy to think that I can handle life on my own. But let's just be honest for a second, right? In the quiet of your own heart, can you just be honest with yourself for a second and ask yourself this? Have you actually been able to handle everything in your life? Are you really wise enough to know better than God? Do you really understand everything that's going on so that your way is the right way? Or is it possible that maybe, just maybe, this crazy idea that a man who, who walked the earth 2,000 years ago and died on a cross could somehow pay the price for your sin. And that somehow if you would just trust in him, if you would just believe him, if you would just know that he is God and submit your life to him as Lord, that you could have eternal life. You could be made clean. Maybe, just maybe, it's true. Well, let me go further than that. Let me tell you that I am living proof that it's true. When I put my trust in Christ, he gave me a new heart. He gave me new life. He cleansed me, washed away my sin, gave me forgiveness and introduced me to a relationship with him. And today I would love to introduce you to a relationship with a God who saves. Listen, your sin is too big for you to overcome. It's worse than any leprosy ever was. Your, your inability to save yourself should be obvious to you by now. And if you've been living your life apart from Christ, let me be a voice that says God loves you and he sent his son to die for you. And if you'll trust him, he'll make you clean. How do you do that? You simply pray. Now, prayer is not a big, terrifying thing. Just talk to God. You can even do it silently. But you're going to have to let him know, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I cannot save myself. I know that Jesus came and died to pay the price for my sin. I believe that he rose again on the third day to set me free from death. And if you'll invite Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, the scripture promises that he'll do just that. Today should be the first day of the rest of your life. Might seem crazy like dipping in the river seven times. It's not. It's trusting in a God who knows more than you do. And some of you who have already believed in Jesus may need to be just reminded today that you don't under, have to understand what God is doing in order to obey him. You don't have to be able to explain everything right now. So many times God doesn't explain to us what he's doing or not doing that we wish he would do. But walking by faith, it's about trusting God enough to obey him even when you don't understand. Now, you may think you've jumped through all the hoops. You may think that God owes you the miracle that you're asking for. Well, here's what I know. The miracle that you may or may not, uh, the miracle that you may be asking for may or may not be a miracle that God wants for your life. But whatever God has for you, I promise you, it's best. Because God is good. God is all-knowing. God is wise. God is all-powerful. And best of all, God loves you with an unbreakable love. And so even as a Christian, if you found yourself walking away, if you found yourself doubting, if you found yourself confused and wondering why God doesn't seem to operate the way you want him to, or maybe you don't like the fact that God has some things to say about your life that you do not want to apply. Maybe you don't like what God has to say about how you ought to handle your finances. Maybe you don't like what God has to say about how you ought to handle your love life. Maybe you don't like what God has to say 
about how you deal with your business life. But guess what? Romans chapter 1, verse 17 says, The righteous shall live by faith. It doesn't mean you have to like everything God says. It doesn't mean you have to understand what God is doing. It means you have to walk by faith. Your righteousness doesn't come from your strength, from your power. It comes from God's amazing, amazing grace. It takes faith to obey God and sacrifice for others. When you think others ought to be sacrificing for you, that's what it means to walk by faith. It takes faith to say no to temptation, especially when it looks like the best thing that's going to come your way. And the things you've asked God for don't seem to be arriving. And, and the world comes along and waves shiny things in front of you. And you think, yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe it's time to go that direction. It takes faith to decide to walk the narrow road when the narrow road seems to be straight uphill sometimes. But don't forget who God is. He loves you. He made a way for you. And he can make you clean. God has a plan for you that is better than the plan you have for yourself. Don't you think it's time that you trust him? Yes, even with your love life, even with your finances, even with your marriage, even with your kids, even with your job. Don't you think it's time that you trust him? Now, now don't get caught up in thinking, oh, but God doesn't speak to me. I haven't heard his voice. Guys, if you have this book, God speaks to you. This is where you can be sure to hear his voice. And you know some basic things that it says in here. It says that you should love your neighbor as yourself. Sometimes that takes faith. It says that you should live a sacrificial life. My friends, that takes faith. It says that you should trust him for your future instead of taking your future into your own hands. And I know that takes faith. But remember, the righteous shall live by faith. Faith is not just theoretical, it's practical. Naaman had to go into that water and come out seven times. I bet by the third or fourth time, he was ready to just stop. But when he came out the seventh time, he was made clean. I don't know how God's going to give you what you need. I don't know when God's going to give you what you need. I don't know what your path is going to look like. I know that sometimes it's not until we get to heaven that we even experience the fullness of what we need from God. But he's taking care of even that if you trust him. Obedience to God is life-changing. Why not take a step of obedience today? I promise you, you will not regret it. Let's pray together. Oh, God. You are so good, so faithful, so powerful, so loving. And you have told us in your word that if we will trust you, you will supply our every need. But God, it's hard for us. It's hard from where we sit. We can't see what you see, Lord. We don't know what you're doing. We don't know what you're thinking. We're in the passenger seat and we just keep reaching for that imaginary break, even though it makes us mad at ourselves for doing it. God, I pray you would just reveal yourself to each one of us in a fresh way through your word, through circumstances, through our hearts. Reveal yourself to us so that we know you so well that we can trust you even more. Lord, thank you that you are the one who cleanses. And I pray, Father, for those who need to be cleansed today from sin, that they would invite you into their lives and know what it is to have the God of the universe as Lord, Savior, and friend. But we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Then from Norton
it's about. It's about the magnification of Christ. That's why we exist. Naaman had to go through some hard times in his journey, but you know what? Almost 3,000 years later, here we are magnifying Christ because of what God did in Naaman's life so long ago. May Christ work in your life in such a profound way that wherever you go, your light will shine and they will glorify your Father in heaven. In other words, in your life, May Christ be magnified. God bless you.